Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. I'm Sal Abenanti, and I'm here on Kickstarter to ask for your support to produce my 115-page color graphic novel, The Hostage. Hostage is set in the streets of Rio de Janeiro based on the flight of the street children that live in the favelas. In the world of the graphic novel, being murdered daily and the hostage is the evil spirit that is raised to avenge their death. Origins go all the way back to the indigenous tribes of the Amazon as the, the spirits that protect children, especially murder children. The level of death that these kids have to endure every day. They have nowhere to sleep, they have no place to eat, they have, they have to survive off of begging. There were nobody in capes that were coming to save these kids. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Happy to welcome Tom Pyre back from Ahoy Comics. Good to see you, Tom. Hey, John. How you doing? Doing all right, man. Good. Uh, you're, you're doing all right. You got uh, two great series that you got uh, going on right now at Ahoy. Um, I always appreciate it, and I was saying this uh, off the air when we were talking. Um, your guys, uh, first of all, Ahoy is one of the best new newer uh, publishers out there in terms of, uh, yeah, it's a, you guys live up to the promise, man. Very funny books and, uh, a great new, uh, unique voice, but obviously leaning on the great genres, but putting your own humor spin on them. And, um, we're going to talk about a couple of really cool books. Uh, one of which, uh, you're continuing your series of the wrong earth mm -hmm. and the adventures of dragonfly on one earth and on, on, I believe earth alpha. And on Earth Omega, we got Dragonfly Man, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, they—that's where they're from. And then they switch. They switch Earths. Um, uh, they don't want to, but they do. They're trapped in each other's societies, each other's worlds, and uh, they both find themselves in a place where even the good guys don't share their values, because one of them is like a campy Silver Age comic, and the other one is like a gritty, teeth clenching, ultra violent post '80s comic. So, uh, and in the new series, the two characters go to a third Earth and bump into each other. Okay, that's what happens because yeah, they're finally colliding in this uh, this new mini series that you've just got underway, and it's Wrong Earth. What's the subtitle? Night and day. Night and day. Very very cool. Yeah, man, it's uh, it's going to be great seeing uh, Dragonfly and Dragonfly Men uh, compare notes in terms of how they handle things and. Um, yeah, honestly, what a, what a great opportunity to uh, create uh, villains that, on the one hand, you can create, you know, standard villains, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but like standard villains you'd see in uh, today's reading world, but also really leaning back on the Silver Age has to be a fun opportunity to create characters that maybe were, would have been in the 66 Batman show or on Wonder Woman in the 70s. Right. It, it uh, It's endlessly fascinating to me that you can um, like look at a superhero's chest emblem and the values it represents depend on what year you were born. You know, if you're older, it might represent truth and justice and, uh, 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 you know, being a, and saluting the flag. And if you're a little younger than that, it might represent bloody revenge. And it's the same logo. A hundred percent. Absolutely, man. Or, you know, God, 
I've loved the discussions over, you know, Captain America. Is Captain America um, a New Deal Democrat? Is that, is that what he represents? Mm-hmm. And I think there are people on the conservative side that would be happy to argue the contrary and sure. find, and find you know, allegiance to Captain America just as much as, uh, you know, uh, liberal progressives would. So, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it is fascinating. And again, yeah, like, um, Jesus, you know, like Dragon, um, Dragonfly Man's obvious uh, inspiration. Uh, just the different facets of uh, of Batman that we saw from the very beginning to where we are now. Yeah, yeah, it really it is. I go along with that that it's really reminiscent of '60s Batman. But if you go back and read comics from the '40s, '50s, and '60s, every superhero was like that. The Batman <laughs> TV show people did not make that up. Right. It was a very fair representation of what comics were up until that time. And, and continue to be for a little while, a little while after that. Um, yeah, and it, it's it's kind of crazy back in the 60s that, like, DC almost took it, like, further after the TV show went on and kind of missed the point of, no, you guys were already doing you what you need to do to represent it and everything. And then they, they, it, they tried to be zany, and it sucked. <laughs> you were already funny. Just be yourself. Yeah, that's a really good point, Jen. <laughs> Jesus, um, no, it's uh, and I love uh, the new additions to uh, the Wrong Earth uh, g- characters. We've got uh, Lady Dragonfly Man, Lady Dragonfly Man. <laughs> it it's actually Lady Dragonfly Man two. The first one was a robot, and uh, but this one sure. was a reformed um, villain, uh, villain of the week, hench woman. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then also just um, the tragedy of uh, Dragonfly Man's sidekick Stinger, and uh, and and not only um, not not only you know what happened to Dragonfly's Stinger, but also Dragonfly Man. Uh, is it who has Stinger too? Doesn't Dragonfly Man have Stinger too? Has Stinger too on Earth Omega. That's I right. Mean, absolutely. Was, when I was writing the first series, I would start to write a scene, and then I would think, wait a minute, I'm with the wrong guy. <laughs> this is a scene for the other guy. That happened to me like five times. I believe it. Absolutely, man. That's awesome. Yeah, so so yeah. Dragonfly Man, the Silver yeah. Age version of the character, finds himself in the gritty world, in the gritty. And, and he needs a sidekick. And it's the, I love, and I, we talked about this the last time you were on, I love how Lancelot-ish the Silver Age Dragonfly Man is, he is unflappable. And even though he's in this completely upside down world that doesn't play by his rules, he'll, he'll adapt. He will. He will. Stay true to himself. He will. He, he gets a little flapped when he finds out what happened to uh, a Dragonfly Stinger. But he, gets, he flaps for slightly, but then he finds some bad guys to beat up and he feels better. <laughs> And Stinger too is kind of a, almost a Jason Todd, where he's kind of a street street criminal and stuff that, you know, Dragonfly Man takes under his wing and is trying to help him see the right the right path. A little more sympathetic. I think he was more of a victim than Jason was, but uh, he, but you're right, he was mixed up with uh, dastardly criminals, and uh, Dragonfly Man does help him. And in that Rock Earth. Uh, night and day, number one, we see a little bit of how that's been going. Absolutely. No, yeah, we do check in on both of them before they uh, go to this third Earth. The um, I, I really, in Dragonfly, um, boy, here's an opportunity to really look at a zero in mid, uh, look at a superhero in mid pain. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like that he's, you know, he's not, he's not past it the way uh, Dark Knight Return depicts Batman. By yeah. then, and stuff. it's it really is in the midst of of you know again losing Stinger and uh, just you know his his starting to doubt himself and kind of go down a pit of despair. He does uh, always have a vodka bottle in the drawer in, in his secret headquarters. <laughs> he makes very, sure. Very Lou Grant. <laughs> very Lou Grant. Very Lou Grant. <laughs> Dragonfly Man does not approve. <laughs> I see, man. This is great. So, um, 
the new story is six issues. Yeah. Awesome. Issues. Very cool. When and uh, chapter one came out in December, right? Yeah. Or did it? Uh, it was like January sixth, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, just a week ago. January sixth. Who could remember that date? Yeah. No kidding. Exactly. Sadly. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah, I, I, know. I thought about Captain America showing up last week. That would have been great. Oh God! And and, and isn't it interesting that uh, the headlines today say uh, Chris Evans is in uh, talks to come back and continue in some oh, great. capacity. I don't know if that's going to be in the Doctor Strange movie, and maybe it's an all you know kind of an alternate Earth version. Thing. I really, at the end of Endgame, I don't know if you felt this way. I would love to see the secret missions of Captain America after he went back and really see him operated, you know, from the 40s through, you know, whenever, whenever he stopped doing it. Maybe they will do something like that. I would love that. I think that would be amazing. Could have Howard Stark and all that stuff. Exactly, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. You know, like, continue the same trappings of Agent Carter, but do it, but doing it with, uh, with Steve being, working covertly. And then the two of them working. Didn't we see Human Torch in the capsule in one of the movies? Oh God! I wish I, I hope so. I, if they, we did, I didn't remember did. that. Yeah, oh, I'd love that. That would be amazing. Maybe maybe the collector had it. You know, I'm thrilled as I'm sure you are. The announcement that DC made recently that uh, they're doing an animated JSA uh, movie. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Absolutely, man. You know, and of course, your great association with uh, JSA continuity and uh, creating the Android Hour Man, and but also. Uh, Giving us further adventures of uh, of uh, Rex and Rick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, Grant and uh, and Howard created. Uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, that's because cool. I mean, obviously, we associate you with the series, of course. Well, Grant saw how lazy I was, and he said, "Well, if Tom's not going to create something for himself, I'm going to create something for him." <laughs> and he handed it to me. Oh my gosh! All right, uh, here, uh, sign is seventeen. Hello, nice to see you, sir. Hey, Thank you for <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, how how did uh, last year impact Ahoy? Well, um, it was, uh, we have a wonderful publisher, Hart Sealy, who did not issue a pencils down order. He let us keep working. And uh, that was great of him. And uh, it probably slowed acquisitions because the future is a little uncertain there. Sure. But uh, in terms of, I mean, we had uh, that period where, uh, you know, a lot of stores were closed and the distributor Diamond was closed and we couldn't put out any comics for a few months there. And then uh, when we finally could put out comics again and we were going to start a new wave of titles because we do waves of mini series that come back and stuff. Yeah. And um, we just decided to shoot every bullet we had, you know, just go for broke and put out everything that's ready. So we had like five, we, we've had like five uh, simultaneous titles running um, this wave. And uh, I write two of them and edit five of them. So uh, a little glassy eyed. <laughs> it's, coming, it's coming to an end pretty soon. There'll be a different division later. Uh, Very good. Great. And uh, I, think, uh, I think our creative people are happy. I hope so. I'm telling you, man, no, the, the product is amazing. And you've got incredible artists and writers and uh, some of my old favorites like uh, like Stuart Moore and, um, and uh, Mark Russell uh, just killing it. And, really? uh, a, a few, and a few new people, too. Um, I love and, and forgive me, I'm not I'm forgetting the title, but the two old ladies that are the monster hunters. Ash and Thorn. That's Ash a and Thorn. That's a beautiful <laughs> book. Uh, Mariah McCourt and Sue Lee. And we had uh, we were lucky to have covers by Jill Thompson. Oh that's great. Oh that's fantastic too. Absolutely, man. Yeah, that's a beautiful book. Absolutely. It, it's out in a collected edition. Oh fantastic. Wonderful, man. Hey, that's great. And yeah. yet, you know, um, Tom, like beyond, like uh, is your, is Ahoy stuff available both digitally and uh, you know paper? Yeah, we are. Okay, we're uh, 
our stuff's available through Comixology. Uh, last week, due to like a glitch in the matrix, the wrong earth didn't come out on Comixology, but it, it is going to tomorrow. Uh, okay. Um, but uh, usually, same day, they're in comic book stores. They're also on Comixology. That's cool. And, you know, again, me and, uh, we're all dealing with COVID in our own ways. But how has it impacted connecting with the Ahoy community, the readership? Well, um, we can't go to shows, obviously. Sure. So uh, we uh, there's a fair amount of communication using Twitter. Um, sometimes we get letters. I love to get letters because that means I have less writing to do on my text pages. <laughs> please send letters, all of you, please. Uh, <laughs> the uh, let, I just put in the next issue of Ron Earth has uh, a letter from like a newspaper from the 17th century because I just couldn't think of what else to put. <laughs> Uh, um, what was the question? <laughs> a, a, a connecting with the community and obviously having doing, doing it online. Players. Actually, it's I've been very very pleased with the quality and amount of interaction we've had on Twitter. Uh, we've got some really really uh, excited fans there, and they're really nice to us, and they let us know how they're feeling about stuff, and they make su suggestions. And, uh, link us to reviews. And it's been pretty solid. That's um, excellent, man. Yeah. The, the Ahoy Twitter feed is called at Ahoy Comic Mags, like magazines. Yep. And uh, it's it's uh, it's a good Twitter feed, I think. That's cool. Well, do would you guys? I mean, again, I, I really I appreciate the level of performance that you do provide in the text pieces and in. The letter columns and and the like. Um, would you ever want to do like any online stuff like what we're doing now? And is there a would there be a streaming Ahoy show? Kind of appropriate with Ahoy that you do I something streaming. Of it. I don't know. Maybe I'll talk to people about it. I'm not. It's uh, we might be busy enough putting out comics. But I can appreciate that might, absolutely. There might be something to that. That's a really good idea, John. Hey, say I'm here to help you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. So how are you keeping sane, Tom, other than writing and uh, making these crazy stories? That is a huge assumption that I'm keeping sane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, well, work keeps me sane. Uh, I just watched uh, Moon Base 8, which is a great TV show. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yes, the show, the showtime uh, yeah. Am I right? The yeah. One? yeah. Yeah. Tim Heidecker was wonderful always. And he specializes in these characters who um, want to do something great for the wrong reasons, like to cover up some hole in themselves. And they're also uniquely unqualified to do what they're attempting. And that's a, that's a wonderful formula. And it's so lifelike. So Moon, moon Base 8 is very funny. It's about some yeah, like it. training to go to the moon and they're not going to go. <laughs> astronauts gone wrong yeah and uh and you know and honestly frankly more satisfying than um um space force was i mean i, I really was rooting for space force and it kind of to me was kind of a mess i was warned away from it so i didn't watch it there you go absolutely man um what do you think of uh as someone who's obviously worked in the superhero genre for genre for as long as you have um, really the last 20 years, I can't believe we're saying this now, but I actually longer than that, if you really want to go back to the current, uh, superhero film era, which I think started with Blade, obviously back in 98. Right. Yeah. So what do you, what do you think of where, where we are now? And, you know, the, the trajectory of these 20 plus I years. It. I love it. I mean, everybody sort of reflexively says, well, this boom is dying. It's over with. And then the next day you know, something comes out and makes a billion dollars. Yep. And um, I love it. I did. I, they, probably the last couple of years, the only movies I went to were either Marvel or Star Wars. <laughs> I 
I can appreciate that. Definitely. Yeah. Man. yeah. Well, and you were even saying before we started recording and I want you to go more into it. Um, that you're that as much as Ahoy didn't want to do superheroes initially, not only, and actually we haven't even started talking about it yet, but it's a good opportunity to talk about uh, Pet Ultra Man, and um, and and just the fact that you guys are doing uh, several books. So you know, again, Second Coming is a superhero book, and uh, you know, I mean, and the Wrong Earth now, and then then Pet Ultra Man. So yeah, Second Coming is wonderful. It's uh, uh, Mark Russell and Richard Pace. And Leonard Kirk, and it's about uh, an odd couple relationship between uh, a caped superhero who can fly and uh, his roommate Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it's not like any superhero comic you've read in your life, which is what we find. We've found that it's really fun to go for that. Let's think of it kind of. A superhero kind of book you have never read that's not like ones you've read and so we get to sort of um, I don't want to say there are things we don't have to do like we don't have to have uh, we don't have to have it be important that the good guy beats the bad guy like it's probably like the fifth most important thing you're thinking about when you read one of our superhero comics and as you suggested we weren't Thing of ourselves as superhero publishers, but but just so much get into it. And there's so much to be mined there. Still, that's mind-boggling to me. I don't know how, but I don't think anything anybody's done anything like Second Coming. Um, Agreed. Yeah, yeah. An Ultiman is about a, you know, a another flying caped superhero who's uh, uh, really perfect and and wonderful and everybody loves him and he's charming and powerful and good inside but really inside he just hates himself and he never gives himself a break and uh, it's it's i guess predictably you would think that it would turn him into a super villain but it doesn't and uh, we're going we're just sort of going along with um, his pain and his android sidekicks repeated attempts to fix his pain uh, which uh are unsuccessful in the beginning anyway Pen penultimate man is from a society that is highly advanced and he is the worst example and least right. evolved of that society so has been shunned from the future mm -hmm. deposited to modern day where his inabilities in his time are still vastly superior to what we have now. And that's right. there therein lies the paradox of him being so admired by the people and yet hating himself and knowing that there's a whole society that's better than him, you know, centuries to come. Yeah, in his formative years he was treated as a primitive throwback and more or less kept in hiding. And uh, so he knew he was inferior to everyone believed he was he was taught he was and so then he comes here and he's he's like he's like the world's most perfect person and how do you you know it's 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 a real whiplash <laughs> of self-image and he can't deal with it how did you would you come up with this tom i mean seriously it's it's, it's really interesting and and what is great about both in the case of Wrong Earth, also Second Coming, really all, all the superhero books, it is an opportunity to really delve into the superhero psyche. I mean, that's that's what's cool. So yeah, where, where did this come from? Well, I, it came from a gag. The first gag I came up with is it, it, sort of, um, we, we built the first story, no, the second story around. The first gag I came up with was, uh, what if a flying cape superhero who had robot duplicates not mentioning any brand names, but what if a flying superhero who had robot duplicates left the robot in charge of his uh, civilian identity and his superhero identity while he goes off and does something? And then when he comes back, the robot has solved all of the problems that have been frustrating him for years. And he it hits him like, how am I so bad at this? <laughs> <laughs> and how is my robot so good at this? 
So that's that sort of triggers the crisis. There are heroes right there. But that was the uh, yeah yeah that's a penultimate man sitting down and sulking, and his android sidekick, anti penultimate. Man. And I will tell you, I will reveal here today, for the first time anywhere, that I just worked on an issue where anti penultimate man builds his own robot assistant and names him pre anti penultimate. Outstanding. That's great, man. Jesus. So you, you guys were kind enough. You sent me four issues. Have, have three been released? How many how many issues have been released so far? Yeah, I think three are out. Okay. So yeah, you gave me a you gave me a taste of uh of issue four. Mm -hmm. So and it's a five issue miniseries. Five, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, no, we'll, and then we'll collect it. Absolutely. We collect yeah. everything if, if you're ever wondering. Is this the first of many or uh what do you think? It depends. Depends on whether people want to. I think there could be more, but I think it's a. If there isn't, there, it's. I'm hoping it's a satisfying end. Okay. Very cool. Excellent. Is there? Um, I haven't seen any Ahoy westerns. Is there an Ahoy western uh, in you guys? No, but uh, our next cover of. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter of Blood shows Edgar Allan Poe in a Western gunfight. <laughs> and uh, because we've been putting him in every, different genres on every cover this time. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's a great book, man. And especially yeah. someone that has grown up with, um, you know, certainly DC's horror books of the 70s and all the gold key stuff. And, and that, you know, it really absolutely, a stroke of genius. Coming up with uh, Snifter of Blood and Edgar Allan Poe as uh, as the host, I mean, it really you know, God, the poor the poor guy. What a what a what a tragic life, but what a brilliant man. And uh, those photos, I mean, yeah, I'm Vincent. Pr I mean, you know, yeah, he really he was almost really Vincent Price 150 years before Price was. He really was. He really was. He was something. I liked it. My favorite thing with the Poe book is to just. Take something delicate and nice that he wrote and just do the stupidest interpretation possible. <laughs> like an exaggeration of what Roger Corman did with those movies. You know, just Absolutely. do the dumbest thing. Like we did an adaptation of uh, The Conqueror Worm. It had giant worms in it. The Conqueror Worm is just a poem about how when you die, worms eat you. But, but you. It can't be a comic without giant worm monsters. Of course not. <laughs> That's what we like to do. And, uh, oh God! Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Go ahead. I was good. All right. I was going to ask. Um, I mean, and this is around the time that you were at DC. Maybe, maybe a little earlier. I forget. But remember Wasteland, the John Ostrander, Del Close horror anthology series. Yeah, I do now. I think that was when I was there. Yeah, that was something. Well, I, ten years. That was amazing, and I and I've asked John, like, how come they've never, you know, brought it back or anything? And I I think uh, if, if probably rights, you know, tangled up and mm -hmm. artists that aren't alive anymore, they'd have to settle with the states to reprint it or whatever. I'm not yeah. really sure, but it's such a shame because it really was so crazy in the best way. Mm -hmm. I'll have to I'll have to look those up. Really, it's literally been 20 years since I thought of them. <laughs> no, I understand. Right, yeah, when, right, yeah. Yeah, when I when I started interviewing John, you know, you know, I was going through you know the bibliography, and I'm like, oh yeah, Wasteland. My God, I got to ask him about Wasteland. Thanks for reminding me of that. When you're there working, your brain just fills up with the stuff you're working on, and you don't have time for what other people are working on. You just don't have time for it. Do you read a lot of uh, do you you know uh, stuff that you're not working on? I mean, where I, I I'm always curious. And again, I've told you we're we're like within I think ten years of each other as far as age. And I I appreciate comic fans that are older than me that are still reading and enjoying it. And I'm always curious, you know. So as I talk to people my age or or, or slightly older, if you're still reading, 
I, do, I read some things. I don't read an awful lot of new things, but I will read new things. I have, uh, uh, you know, Comicsology Unlimited and stuff. I'll check in on things. But, boy, for pleasure, I, I mostly just read the dead guys. You know, the, uh, I can still go back to a Bob Haney story and just love it, you know, or a Bob Kaniger, but uh, old Kirby stuff. Sure. And that's your, you can love comics your whole life and you can love new comics your whole life. But the stuff that really stabs you through the heart is the stuff you read when you were six, seven, eight years old. Totally, and man. It yeah. stays that way your whole life. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. I think I was lucky growing up in the 70s because beyond, you know, uh, the reprint stuff that we got in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Really made me appreciate not only what was coming out then, but also Silver Age and even Golden Age stuff. So, yeah. The Golden Age, we didn't get that much. Hardly. Yeah. Uh, so, that, yeah, that had to be amazing. Yeah, well, you know. Absolutely. And uh, and now it's just fun looking back and really finding out because credits weren't what they are now. Uh, you know, who wrote what and who drew what. Yeah. And, you know, the one area I haven't really explored yet, and I am still curious to do it, especially from an art standpoint, are the romance comics. Mm -hmm. the oh, there were some wonderful uh, runs of romance comics. I mean, Romita was kind of the face of romance at DC for a while. Later on, I think, um, I forget which title, uh, Joe Orlando inherited one of the romance comics in the late 60s, early 70s, and boy, he brought great artists. Um, so they, I, I like romance comics. I met uh, Barbara Freelander, and she was an associate editor in the mid-60s mm -hmm. for, for a couple of the books. And uh, J. Scott Pike is the one artist oh, that yeah. she really introduced me to. And yeah. my God, it, it's it's too bad that he didn't like superhero comics because yeah. he would have been amazing on those. And he's he just the the as much as we love guys like Kurt Swan that could really show great emotion in the faces and stuff like that. Pike was another person like that, and he would have been incredible on uh, superhero comics. I know he already was doing the romance stuff he was doing. Right, he did he did Anthro, right? Did he? I didn't know that. Oh yeah. wow. Yeah. Okay, that's wow, that's cool. Yeah. Anthro, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I love that stuff. I'm I really honestly right now, um, it seems like with what happened in uh, DC's uh death metal event, that they're starting to re explore a bunch of uh characters like Anthro, those those ultra, the multi alien people like that. Yeah, I got it wrong. It was uh how he posted Anthro and Jay Scott Pike did Dolphin. Oh, well, that makes sense because Dolphin is just beautiful. Yeah, right, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Jesus. I'm telling you, man, no, it's uh, truly discovering these people is, you know, rediscovering them. It's it's amazing, and you really appreciate just the level of uh, craftsmanship that was going on back then in the Silver Age. I, l I like going back to the 50s, too. It's before my time. But with those, I just... Uh, these people are saints to me because they got uh, no credit, very little pay, and they were reviled. They had Congress people making speeches against them on television. Yeah, They loved comics so much, they just kept doing it and tried to make them better. And uh, they're, they're, they are saints to me. I'm with you, man. No, like uh, Ramona Fraden doing uh, Aquaman. Alex Toth. Toth, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Williamson, all the EC guys. Yeah, yeah. And the raw deal they got, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I like to keep their flame burning if I can. Just I'm with you, man. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's excellent. So would there ever be any uh, public domain uh, characters that Ahoy might want to grab and uh, <laughs> corrupt with <laughs> your guys' sense of humor? It sounds like fun. It sounds like fun. <laughs> I, I, it's crossed my mind a little bit, but not to the point where I've even looked to see who I'd want. Uh, there are some weird characters back then. There were some really weird characters, you know, like 
men who dress up as women to fight crime. Jimmy Olsen. Jimmy Olsen. Jimmy Olsen was cross-dressing all the time. All the time. All the time. <laughs> and remember the mobster tried to kiss him and he said, uh, okay, but I have to turn the light off first. So he turns the light off and he holds the chimp up to the mobster's oh. lips. And <laughs> that's literature, my friend. Uh, I, you know, I, I was telling Lieber and, and Matt Fraction and their recent run on Jimmy Olsen, I, I really think they, in a modern way, were able to connect with what made uh, those Silver Age comics so great. And they are, they are so bonkers. They re- I, I love the Jimmy Olsen comics. I love what they did, too. I really do. There's some bright spots to that. I mean, everybody likes the same ones, I guess. Uh, you know, the, this Hulk series. Oh, my God, Al Ewing and, and company. Absolutely. So great. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you, man. It's so funny. I haven't had a chance to talk to Al yet. I, uh, I I got to because you're right. And I, I've talked to Alex uh, Ross about his run of, of covers during that whole thing and everything. And again, another book that I'm sure you were a fan of back in the day, the old black and white uh, Hulk magazine. Oh, I love that. I love that. It, uh, you could put like a really heavy, highly stylized anchor like uh, uh, Alfredo Cala on Walt Simonson, and you could still tell it was Walt Simonson because his stuff was so deep and so three-dimensional and so action-packed. Those, God, what a, those were beautiful books. You know, really, and the more I think about it now and just off the top of my head, that Bronze Age of the 70s, you really had great experimentation in format. You also had the influx of the incredible uh, Philippine artists that we were seeing for the first times mm-hmm. and they were coming with their with their stuff the writers um and and a lot of in, in the cases of marvel that you know kind of the the angle hearts and and people like that that were you know early 70s writers jerry conway obviously is another steve one Gerber, man. steve man. Gerber, definitely yeah man i mean that's like what a great you know just kind of mixture of format and 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 talent and just the crazy great ideas that came Marvel. during that period. Marvel in the 70s was wonderful for every reason you mentioned, but also it was kind of, there was like an atmosphere of creative exploration, but it was also like a grindhouse. You know, it, was, it was such an exploitation house. Okay. Absolutely. The kids love zombies. Let's do a zombie. You know? And uh, we did yeah, a exploitation. Luke Cage, absolutely, and uh, you yeah. know, no, and then Shang Chi with martial arts, absolutely. All the, uh, yeah, all, so many genres. See too. Did you see a book we did called Bronze Age Boogie? I didn't. It's Stuart Moore wrote it. Alberto Conticelli drew it, and it is every one of those uh, '70s genre tropes mushed into a comic. Everything but superheroes. Oh, that's great. We've got like, um, you know, you've got a Kung Fu character and a streetwise uh, detective uh, who's a black woman. And you've got uh, tripod Martians, <laughs> uh, uh, t- talking apes. Excellent. It's all there. So, Oh, my God. Yeah. Is it a miniseries or was it a one shot? It, uh, it was a series that is collected. There's oh, fantastic. Series. Yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, no, what are you talking about? As soon as we hang up, I'm going to be <laughs> grabbing it. <laughs> That's outstanding, man. Well, I think you'd love it. He's even, he, I should, there's something I should say for a surprise, but you'll recognize something in there from the early Marvel, or from those Marvel books that you're not expecting. That's excellent. Some of the greatest innovations came from the 70s. Being a Brit, I would have to include 2000 AD, 100% Bunyan Snipe. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure discovering that stuff secondhand. Uh, God, Future Shocks and all those great, you know, Rogue Nation or Rogue Warrior. I love all those characters. Oh, and the people they had in the beginning: Ryan Bolland and Dave Gibbons, uh, John Wagner, and Alan Grant, Bad Mills. Yeah, Wagner's a genius. I agree with you, man. No, I, I'm a, I'm a big Wagner fan. Absolutely loved when he was on Batman in the '90s. Yep, me too. Yeah. No, it's it really is. I mean, again, uh, that it re- there must have been something in the water back then. 
<laughs> Globally. Yeah, there must have been. <laughs> you know, I, 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 it's, it's amazing. And, uh, and that's why it's so great now, because much like then, I really feel like all the genres are being explored in, in the best ways. I mean, we really, it, it really is another, uh, I don't, I, if you don't want to call it a second golden age, I, I don't know what metal you want to attribute to the current era to, but we're getting really quality books. The uh, CPA age. What's that, the CPA age? The Ahoy age. It could be the Ahoy age, absolutely, man. Absolutely. No, no question. No, you honestly got, dude, uh, all the, all the books I've read, they're, they are absolutely hilarious and we need that. We certainly need that this year after yeah. all the nonsense that we've been going through. So really, if you, if you miss fun books that are hilarious, the Ahoy crew uh, has got you covered with a lot of really, really great books. And uh, certainly Tom's books, uh, you know, uh, Penultimate and, um, and the wrong earth are, are classic examples of that. But really, you should just go to uh, what's the website for the for the publisher? Uh, Comicsahoy.com. Uh, recently updated. Fantastic, and yeah, man, the library is waiting for you. And uh, go to your local shop and uh, order order some of these incredible books. But uh, as always, Tom, it's it's great to talk to you, and continued success. Thank you. Um, I, I, I yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Anytime you got something new, man, you're always welcome back to talk more. Thank you. I had a really good time. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Tom Pyre, everybody. Hope you enjoyed uh, today's Word Balloon Live. Later tonight, I'll be talking about, you a fan of uh, Outer Limits, Tom? The original Outer yeah. Limits? Gabe yeah. Hartman and I and company, we've been uh, re-watching the first season. And we're going to be talking about episode 22, I believe, tonight. Uh, late night, it's going to be at um, 9.30 Pacific. 11.30 Central, 12.30 a.m. Eastern. So we'll be talking about that. And then tomorrow, I'm very excited, I'll be doing a boxing show with uh, the, the people behind Ringside Seat, a fantastic magazine, and some of my favorite writers uh, of boxing. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the current scene, but also their great coverage of the history of boxing. So that'll be on Word Balloon uh, Live tomorrow night. So until then, thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, stay safe, stay happy.